Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, this session uh, with LSEG and uh, Refinitiv, talking about data, uh, data science, sports science, and all things rugby and harlequins. So very excited to, to, to have you with us today. I'd love to get your questions. Uh, um, so please do, uh, if you look in, in the um, in the ON24 platform, if you go down, you can see there's a Q&A box. Uh, if you put questions in now, I'll look at them at the end and, and I'll try to, to ask those questions um, as we go through. Um, there's a toolbar at the bottom of, of your screen and you should be able to access uh, resources there like biographies, some additional materi uh, materials. Uh, any technical support questions you have, you can ask them there. Uh, you don't need to ask uh, those in the Q&A. Uh, Tom and I won't know how to help you. So just ask them down there and somebody will help you. And there's also a survey at the end to ask uh, Get your feedback on if you if you if you found this a helpful session. It is being recorded, and it will be available afterwards. Um, so you know if you enjoy this, you can watch it again or share it with your with your friends and colleagues. So to the main the main event. Um, firstly, I, I'm Jeff Horrell. I'm Group Head of Innovation at the London Stock Exchange Group. More importantly, I'm a big rugby fan, um, and I had a fasc I'm fascinated by the use of data. And the scientific approach that is now in play in, in professional sports, um, it's really changed over the years. And I was very lucky enough to, to uh, through Refinitiv's relationship with Harlequins, go down to the training ground and meet with Tom and some of his colleagues to see in the back room how uh, they prepare and how they, they work um, to get the players uh, ready and to think about the strategy and, anal and analytics that goes into creating a, a winning team. So I'm delighted to be joined by Tom uh, today. Uh, Tom is the lead sports scientist at Harlequins, and he's responsible for GPS monitoring, uh, reporting recovery, uh, looking at new uh, research and applying that research um, to kind of get the best from from the whole squad. And uh, obviously, this is you know we're uh, many financial colleagues on the phone before Tom uh, joined. Uh, and, and moved into sport. He was uh, actually worked in this very building, the building that I'm in right now in 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 Kerry Wharf, um, as a prime bro brokerage uh, relationship manager at BNP Paribas. So he knows both the finance world and uh, and the sporting world. So I'm sure if you want to ask him questions about um, BNP, you're very welcome to ask him in the Q and A. I don't think we'll get to them, but you can try uh, and see. But I'm sure we'll have more sports questions than anything else. So uh, welcome to the, the call. As I said, welcome to Tom. And first of all, I'm going to kick off with uh, Tom. Tom, just massive congratulations, really, um, for last season. I think everyone was just absolutely wrapped with attention to see Harlequins play uh, those amazing uh, quarterfinals, semifinals, uh, the final. Um, how does it feel to be a Premiership champion in a Premiership Championship? And, and were you able to enjoy that moment? I mean, all the hard work that you do, were you able to kind of sit down and, and actually <laughs> take it in? Uh, yeah, I was actually in a very lucky, privileged position that um, we rotate who works on the game days. So I was rotated off for the game. So my colleague Ed and Gaz were working the game. So I got to watch it as a fan. And I also got to watch Bristol as a fan as well, which was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I definitely got to enjoy it that day. Didn't enjoy the next day so much. Um, but like it, it was bizarre, especially last year, where probably in January the idea of winning the championship would have seemed like a punchline to a joke. Um, to then win the whole thing was an amazing feeling. I think it's also nice having been there for eight, nine years now. Um, there's guys there that I've worked with for that whole period, and it's a funny thing. Like when you when you have success like we do, you often focus on those immediate six months, and there was a lot that changed. But also there's guys there that have worked pretty much their entire careers towards that. So there's some guys, they've got the guys like Danny and Joe, who've now won it twice, eight years apart. Um, guys like Marcus, who've only been playing rugby for two, three years and has, has won it already. And then you've got other guys who kind of fall in between. That's the guys like James Chisholm, Joe Marchant, who were too young to be involved in 20, the, the first win in 2011, 2012. Um, and it's just nice, like, you know, like, Quinn's is a big, big family. 
and you get you know you most of those kids have more operations in a couple of years than most people have in a lifetime so seeing that pay off for them as a group was really quite nice it's, it's been enjoyable it's, it's short-lived in sport because five weeks later you're back in for pre-season and no one well people who care that you're champions because they want to knock you off your pedestal but um yeah it's an amazing place to be it's nice to be to be a target i guess listen to what you're saying about you know the journey that, that the family they've grown up together um and been through so many experiences together and, and i'm sure we'll cut, touch on that later in terms of the, the way the team has come together just on the last point you made though so now that you're defending champions does that does that put additional pressure on you? Have you felt, um, you know, is it, does it, is it more confidence in the team that, yes, we can do this? Or is there a bit of extra pressure? And how, how does that change your preparation? Has your preparation changed uh, at all because of that? Uh, I don't think the, the preparation hasn't changed. Like We found a physical model that we feel like works for our current group. Uh, we're having discussions about whether it works for our younger lads. Um, because, like I said, like you have to view an athlete's development over a long period, and sometimes what works now for a senior group that's constantly playing doesn't work for those individuals who aren't constantly playing, so they're not getting the same uh, stimulus, the same sort of dose from not playing every week. So how do you manufacture that? So you, you're creating the next Matt Simmons, who's got an incredible engine. Like That man played 134 minutes of rugby, against Bristol and what helps is that he has a he was a GB age group rower so he he literally has the lungs of a horse but then you look at some younger guys like a, a Hugh Tizard a George Hammond and we're sort of discussing well how do you move them forward um but to go back to your like these sort of original question about the pressure like it gets talked about like we know that everyone's you know everyone's going to be like we're playing the champions this weekend uh, it doesn't change our physical preparation because I think that's something that we we understand and we know we don't you don't need to change anything physical for that. Um, and I think also there's a it's actually probably instilled more confidence in the playing group and support staff group. I think for years we always said if you get us into the playoffs we'll win the whole thing. We just never got into the playoffs. And then the first year for a long time, maybe six years, we got into the playoffs. We won it. Because uh, we have quite an exceptional group. We've got leaders like Danny Kerr, Joe Marler, who have, you know, Joe's played British and Irish Lions. He's played at the highest level. Uh, so he knows how to handle pressure. Likewise, Danny. And then oh, you've got some uh, amazing youngsters. I think there's a tendency to look at younger generations and sort of, you know, say that they have it easy or whatever. But the the to par paraphrase a band, I guess the kids are all right. Like the guys like Marcus, Caden Murley, like, mentally and physically are very well uh skilled to deal with pressure and and they're, they're nice to work with as well which makes my job a lot easier right i think often we see that people say well you know these are the next generation we have to you know it'll be a few years until they're ready but i think one of the great things for harlequins you've put in those young players in like marcus smith you know maybe earlier than some other clubs would have and and they've really stepped up to it so um, a, lot of, a lot of pressure on their shoulders, but obviously the environment, that family environment that you've, you've mentioned, seems to be to be in place. Just on on the kind of style of play, we just talked about that. If people who aren't aware, the sort of Harlequins play a very um, open, um, you know, an open and, and kind of um, free flowing kind of uh, style of, of rugby. I could imagine that, you know, as a sort of scientific approach this sort of very structured approach like looking at set pieces and box kicking and, and certain tactics defensive tactics that's really been in vogue for a number of years and people have been saying this last couple of seasons it's very boring kind of games i can see how data analysis might play a role in, in sort of analyzing those kind of you know situations but harlequins is very different right in terms of that open style of play so from a sports science perspective how are you supporting that you know a slightly chaotic a style of play that that was so effective uh, last season so i guess there's two elements to the answer one is so this isn't letting the cat out the bag our attack coach nick evans said this on tv that we are the kaiser soze which is usual suspects if you haven't seen the film of premiership rugby we kicked more i think or amongst the most than anyone else in the league last year and we have one of the most dominant scrums in the league. Um, so, like, it is founded on a bedrock, a bedrock of, like, in Marcus and Tommy Allen, the two fly halves, and, like, in sound tactical kicking. And Danny, 
with all his experience, he's a phenomenal kicker from scrum half. And so Scott Steele, the other, other lads who step in. So there is this bedrock of, of that. And the scrum's fantastic. The forward pack, I don't think, get enough credit. But aside from that, obviously, we then do pride ourselves in sort of thriving in chaos. And it's something that we're really, really good at. And I think a lot of that comes down to our coaching staff who've um, we've worked with to implement games that basically surpass certain aspects of the physical demands and tactical demands you'll get in a weekday. So we have like a 12, nine, 12 minute block on a Tuesday where, so if you took someone's average speed, so the sort of meters per minute they cover in a game, a like, so someone like Marcus might cover 85 to 90 meters a minute for 80 minutes in those block of games, he'll be covering 160 to 180 meters per minute. So that far surpasses the running demands of a game. Now we don't do, as much contact in that game because it's so fast and frantic that if you put in um, contact, it would basically probably resemble like a monster truck derby with human people. So like it doesn't really work, but that's very focused on being chaotic. So Nick Evans drives the chaos, essentially, like he almost pretty much changes the rules on the fly to make people adapt. And I think that's probably like a philosophy that's been core to us is that you you kind of have to thrive in those situations and especially the premiership is so tight now like there's 13 high quality teams there that can be anyone on any day that you're probably gonna get in a a, you know a tight clash you're gonna get two or three moments where you get to to change the game and like you look at bristol when we beat them there's an unfielded kick that is chaotic that alex dombrand catches and scores a try there is then a tackle and a drop ball that James Chisholm picks up and scores a try. And you look at most of it, like when we get a turnover, if the kick is not the best option, we know that that's when the defence is most disorganised. Um, and that's kind of probably what's core to us is that when the chaos comes or when we want to be chaotic, we use it at the right time. And like I said, it's, it is a, it's an element of Kaiser Soze. Like we're, we're, we're pretty good at structure stuff as well. We just hide it behind utter chaos. You, you, you hide the structure is there, but it's um, people focus yeah. on, on on the other elements, which that that sets up. So on that, you said talk about pre- preparing the players for that more. I'm not sure just Silas. That is, the, you've mentioned sort of fitness and and doing those kind of, you know, extreme kind of you know chaos ball type type training sessions. Is it is it also about a mental preparation to be able to rebound and adapt to these situations? And you know, if you're down, you you, you know that you're going to get back up. And how? How, do, how does the team prepare for that? Yeah, I think we just benefit from having some exceptional senior leaders and them having very good relationships with the coaches, like guys like Maxim and Stefan Louise, Andre Esterhazen, who stepped in, Joe Marla, Danny, like the guys I've already mentioned and the youngsters. I think we've got this nice blend where you've got enough people who've been experienced, who've been through bad experiences to have learned from them and they've you know i think in within sport you get guided by some individuals about how you reflect on your own practice as a player as a, as a support staff member but i think we've also got a nice blend of the youngsters who just haven't had that experience and we've not we've deliberately tried not to uh, traumatize is too strong a word but you don't when something's going badly the last thing i think you want to do is hammer that person like you want to lift them up especially in the young guys and really say to them like, we, we've 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 paid their contracts on the idea of we like how they play so we want you to play. Like we, we don't want you to batten down the hatches. Um, and th- that's the nice bend we've probably got. We've got the senior guys who've been there and done that and the inexperienced guys who haven't had those negative experiences. And we kind of just want to keep encouraging them. Like they'll have those negative experiences. You're not going to shield them and you shouldn't want to shield them from it. Um, but we don't want their reaction to the negative experiences to be to go into their shells and to not play the Harlequins yeah. way. Um, because I think... it as a group collectively now we'd rather go down all guns blazing than go down not being us right you you mentioned there um about the management group so i mean i think i can't go through this without asking you the difficult question which obviously midway through the season paul gustard who was the coach um you know, left the club and there was a very significant change, you know, after that. Um, Just can you take us inside, you know, what was happening um, at that time and and how you've talked about it already a little bit, but how did the players react to that change? 
And was it was it a case of more res- those players stepping up and taking on more responsibility? And and for you in the back back room staff, if you like, how did you step up and change? You know the responsibility that you were taking to, to take things forward. Yeah, I think there's there's a multi like there's a multitude of factors that sort of came into play. A, we've got a relatively young coaching group who have a vast amount of coaching experience and playing experience. Like Nick Evans, All Black, Harlequins legend integral to any success the club has had in the last two decades probably adam jones for most rugby people needs very little introduction in terms of his knowledge and ability to develop scrummaging players like you know he's done an amazing job with the guys we've got and guys like kyle sinkler who's now off at bristol like they had a very good relationship and what was most i think what they did so amazingly well is they really empowered the players while still guiding them because that's that's what um without sounding too cheesy, that's, that's what like leadership is. It's your ability to like guide people and, you know, support and provide answers without, uh, like without being overbearing. And that's so hard to do, right? Because especially if you're an ex player, you've, you've experienced the game day. So you, what you want to intervene, you know, what needs to be done. And actually the man, you just got to sit back and watch. Right. And they did that amazingly. There's also a, a second guy who gets a lot of plaudits and I, a guy called Andrew Sanger, who's, Actually, I think got an MBE. So he was, I'll probably get his military record wrong, but he was heavily involved in Afghanistan, Iraq. He worked with bomb disposal teams. He's worked across a variety of roles within the army. So this is a man who has experience in terms of the extremes of the human experience, way beyond anyone at a rugby club will ever have. Uh, And he was integral to sort of, he has incredibly close relationships with the players and integral to helping them realize an environment in which they could thrive and the coaches were massive in that and then you've also got guys like gareth tong who's head of athletic performance mike lancaster who's head of medicine who have been around for a long time and are able to provide the stability of sports science sports medicine around everything else to fluctuate because when you know not everything changes like we didn't change how we rehabbed an acl that happens irregard like that should always happen regardless of who your coach is we didn't change how we monitored the players we didn't change how we uh, conditioned the players. We changed slightly how we trained, but that was it, really. Um, but yeah, like I think then you, once you've gone through the sort of staff and the key individuals, like that, the playing group. Again, we're just so lucky to have. Is what I sort of said earlier that like the senior players who've been through enough. Unfortunately, in professional sport, a lot of head coaches lose their job, which is bizarre because they're never the ones who play the sport. Um, but only it's organisationally their head that rolls. So they've been through enough transitions. The youngsters probably haven't been through many. And I think right. when you, you you know, you've got the right framework around a group like we have, who are amazingly talented, uh, you know, you often see it in most sports, you get a bounce when there's a change. We were just lucky that our bounce lasted long enough and seems to be perpetuating and seems to have, have gathered some momentum. Um, still early days yet. It's still only, we've only played four games this year. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I joke, I've got a friend who now works at Bristol. I joked with him, like, it doesn't really matter till you get till February because that, like, we, we, were, we weren't really going anywhere till February. So, you know, it's a tight league. It can all change. Yeah, you don't want to leave it, leave it, leave it too late this year, I'm sure. But no. it's, 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 it's like, better for TV, oh, though. It's, yeah, it's good, good, good for the TV ratings, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the, it sounds like, the, you know, the structure, the stability was there, and then also the, 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 the breadth of, of leadership. You've talked about so many people, and, and I guess perhaps not everyone is aware of all the different people that are involved in in a professional yeah. rugby team and all the different skills and and, and, and talents that are there uh, and different areas of of, of um, support that they're in place. One thing we haven't really talked about yet is, is about the data, right? And and kind of the, the, the sort of sports science aspect of it. It'd be great to just understand. You just talked about there, you know, sort of rehabbing for for an ACL or perhaps just sort of player recovery. Like, how are you using data and analytics to kind of understand individual player um, performance and kind of what they need individually to kind of yeah. get to their their peak performance? Um, be great to just hear hear how that works on a, on a you know on an average day or an average week. Yeah, so I guess the key thing is is all the physical stuff we do is supporting the rugby. So we want to see whatever we change physically uh, transfer onto the pitch. So like doesn't matter if I make or the our S&C team make someone stronger if it doesn't result in a more dominant scrum 
or them being faster or more elusive. So we try and tie everything into rugby. In terms of the data, we then collect that on a on a match level. The stuff the analysts get now is, and you've probably seen it in a lot of sports, it is ridiculously rich. So we get an X and a Y coordinate to every action, to every individual, who the referee was, who was on the pitch at the same time, what was the outcome of that action. Uh, and not as much, like, beyond now. So we can look at which opponents or which one of our players misses the most tackles when they're beaten by footwork versus, and if it happens in the wide 15 channel. Like, you can, that stuff is so rich now, and that's probably, like, a new avenue that's kind of opening up in sport is that, and one that I'm certainly not at the vanguard of is where we're probably starting to look more at real, like, data scientists rather than sports scientists because... I mean, you you guys will know this better than we do. The the, the level of uh, complexity you can deal with now with machine learning, AI, etc., far supersedes anything that people really are doing. Certainly in rugby, I think football financially being more advanced is more advanced. Um, but that is starting to move into every aspect of what we do. Um, and then also, like medically, we collect a lot of data on the guys, like. So at the start of the season, we'll do concussion baselines. So this is the sort of like memory tests and all that like balance tests where that is presumed to be your uh, brain function at normal. So when someone's concussed, we, that has to return to normal before they can return to play. And likewise with other injuries. So we, we all know the capacities of certain joints, certain movements, and that's some marker we then use when it comes to return to play. On top of that, we then know every meter they cover in terms of the the GPS monitoring we use. So we know how much they'll cover in a game, how much they'll cover in a training session. Like I said earlier, there'll be certain sections of training that we target for physical outputs. But most importantly, we're just basically monitoring what the guys do week to week to ensure there's no big spike. Um, and like I was saying too earlier, when you've got guys not involved in the match day squad, we then have to look at that data and say, well, if a player goes down injured this week is the next guy off the rank. Is he physically ready to perform? Because game day will bring a bunch of emotional and tactical challenges that we can try and prepare them for as best as possible, but they are fairly unique to game day. Um, the physical stuff is kind of easy. So like that's where we then add in extra sessions, et cetera, to, to make sure those guys who are on the cusp of playing are ready to go. And then also with a longer term view, like we know that, you know, your academy second row, you want them to clock up a lot of miles to generate a big engine so that when they get to late 20s, early 30s, I might be doing Matt Simmons a disservice there, but they're in a similar physical shape to him. Mm -hmm. And that takes years. And that's what, going back to what we were saying about winning last year, is like, it's taken some of those guys, um, you know, a decade, 16 years of professionalism to get to that point. So whilst the last six months did provide a catalyst like the work is a long time off and i think that's probably one of my uh bugbear is too negative but i think sometimes in sport we're quick to be like oh what happened this week to win that but actually you look at someone like a, a marcus smith who's still relatively young you're like he learned those skills way away from us in brighton college and he learned them with our academy coaches so if you want to know why marcus and also there'll be an element of he learned it potentially when he first picked up a rugby ball over in Manila. Like, it, it, there's so many people in there that to focus on the last six months sometimes is difficult. But with the data stuff now, we have his life pretty much from the minute he touches our academy to yesterday's training session. It's, it's quite incredible, I imagine, what, what's possible now versus, you know, when you, perhaps when you join, in terms of having that data profile of every player, how many meters they've run, the kind of contact they've made, you know, how many minutes... Uh, of game time and that that in, i was just interested that that baseline of you know movement and and, and 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 fitness and different joints and so on i guess i mean recovery from injury is obviously a critical element in this sport i mean is that do you is that a lot of, is that still a data-driven process or is there is there a, sort of the medical team just you know applying different approaches there yeah i think because I would say sports medicine has always been and still is ahead of sports science in a lot of ways it's practice because it comes from medicine, right? So um, ACL and Achilles ruptures, so ACL ruptures and Achilles ruptures are things that used to take a year that now take like six, nine months and you can get them back to fairly high levels of, of, of play relatively quickly. And that's driven mainly by the ability we have to know markers, know what we can push. Like, you know, when when... 
it is incredible the amount of information that the the medics can give you and the the physios can give you around what's happening with that injury like you know performing scans you can see if the collagen is thickening in the achilles tendon if the blood flow to it using like the ultrasound doppler that all these things are actually so the ultrasound doppler comes from obviously like anyone who's had a pregnancy you can see the placenta pulsating with it well that's the same with a tendon um and the amount of information they have is is phenomenal and that's i think an area that is going to continue to see investment because i can um, I can see a question in the Q and A actually about the, the the impacts and stuff. Like rugby is such a collision heavy sport that um, it is like an A and E department after a game, and we have a obligation uh, legally, but also I think morally probably to look after them. And when it comes to the, the tackle and scrum stuff, we now use um, mouth guards that have accelerometers embedded in them, so that gives us data about the number of G's that are basically going through. Well, so it's a number of Gs that actually go through the mouth guard, but extrapolated out to be through the skull. Like you can presume if you've got X amount of rotational force going through a mouth guard, that is likely seen in the skull as well because the mouth guard is pretty much wedged to your teeth. Um, and that plays a part in our return to play process. We can then look at a game week and we can think, well, this is what they need to go through in the return to play process to be ready. Like our general principle is that if you can't do the high intensity training, you probably shouldn't do the match. Like that's probably been a reversal of several years ago where you'd kind of go softly, softly just to get them back to the match. And then you kind of throw them into the game and hope they survive. Whereas now the training in some ways is probably way, it's not more rigorous because nothing matches a game, but we've made it as intense and as dense as well as possible, sometimes surpassing a game so that you're more confident. And every step of the way of that medical process, there's markers they have to hit, whether it's how far, your knee can move over your ankle with like an ankle injury or the number of degrees of flexion you can get at your knee to then more advanced stuff where we use force plates, which are basically big fancy scales uh, that tell you how you're interacting with the floor when you jump, when you sprint. And that we're looking for that to return to baseline or at least to, to be similar left to right so that you know that your injured side is as good or as close to as good as your other side. And that's done every step of the way with data. And uh, it's bizarre. Like when, until I talk about it, I don't really realize how much we use. You kind of think of it being comparative to financial services, relatively data light. Um, and it's like everything in life with apps and phones and stuff and uh, Apple Watches, whatever. Like data is, it is so embedded in your life, you don't even know it's there. Um, you which well, I what do you probably describe the most it is like, like you know, rich in terms of really each each individual type of injury or each individual part of the body or each individual aspect that you have to prepare, you've got a sort of specialized way of looking at it and analyzing it. And I think, you know, that you know, this relationship to what we do in in the business of being very focused on individual areas and getting, you know, very specialized and those techniques and approaches, you know, um developing. Um you mentioned I mean, obviously I'm in the innovation team here, and you mentioned the use of the gum shields and the accelerometers. It's a fascinating article in The Guardian uh, about that. If anyone wants to read that further, it's, it's a really, really interesting piece. But I'm interested in how that, how that came about. Was that, are you always looking to see, like, what are people in different sports doing or in this sport looking around seeing what people are doing? Or do you have, um, you know, researchers approach you and saying, hey, we have this idea, we want to, to see if you would want to experiment. How do you kind of pick up on innovations in, in sports science? And, you know, how did that decision, you know, get made to kind of use that? Yeah, so the mouth guards directly come from our head of medicine, Mike Lancaster, who I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's the way we generally try to operate, um, I don't know, it's not really a philosophy we've ever probably written down, but like anyone can bring an idea to the table and discuss it because they, you know the world is pretty much open source now, right? So I might see a medical thing and raise it with our head of medicine. Now, I'll rely on his expertise because I'll be like, well, this guy knows way more about medical stuff than I do. And likewise with the mouth guards, when initially it came, we just I just sat on a call with Mike and sort of listened to what ProTech, the, the company, we're saying about their accelerometers and whether or not it fitted with what I knew about what accelerometers can do and can't do. And then um, we sort of took it on as a trial and they've been amazingly supportive as well, which is, which is no surprise because it's their business. Um, but they've been fantastic throughout and they're sort of, you know, they've moved off into UFC and all kinds of other crazy sports where you take crazy collisions and stuff. Um, and I guess the answer to your approach, like 
it's I think you're in a bad place organizationally if you have a set overly set stream of where it comes into. So like we have general processes that once we've onboarded or brought in some technology, we're looking like you know, the validity and reliability of it all and then the applicability of it. So like you get lots of stuff in sports science that does tell you what it's meant to be telling you and is valid, but doesn't actually allow you to change decision making. So it has to be something that enables you to actually make a better decision. And the mouth guards fell into that because the GPS largely just looks at uh, running demands. So acceleration and velocity based running demands. Whereas the mouth guard was telling us something that's that's pretty important, and that's the the impacts occurring to the head, which obviously has a knock on effect with brain health. Um, yeah. But our process is that's fairly open. We were talking about this before, right? That you know, uh, you know, with GPS, it's really just giving you that 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 this is in terms of actual location and, and tactics. It's not as good because it's not as a, not accurate enough. What are you seeing from the the, the gum shield? Is it is it accurate enough? Is it telling you? new information are you finding it is it, is it yeah. useful is it changing the way that you're preparing the, the players yeah i think one of the things that when we i often find this and maybe it's a marker of how stupid i am but like there's stuff that once you hear it it makes sense but before that you never thought of it so the obvious uh image most people will have of contact training in rugby is someone holding like a big mini mattress like a padded shield you know well that's contact that's intense but when someone like hugs another person to a stop like like a more aggressive touch you're like oh that's not so much um that's not an, as an aggressive collision because there's no shield there there's no massive wallop and an air rushing out of a of a tackle shield but actually what we found in the mouth guard data is actually which makes complete sense is that there's no shield there there's nothing dissipating energy so therefore when two people like hug each other to a stop that's actually a faster deceleration on the skull than the shield so that then changed our sort of thought processes about collision loading. We now we now probably do the same amount of time of collision work, but it, we've tailored the drills because of the feedback that Mike and uh, the guys at ProTech were able to give the coaches that enable us to sort of actually target drills that better replicate what we're trying to get after and also adapt drills to then when we want to lessen the load, we can. Because um, the rugby season is, well, depending on COVID seasons or whatnot, it can be 63 yeah, weeks, now, right? 48 weeks yeah. or whatever, right? So um, you've got to manage them over the long term. And also, like, over the length of someone's career, if you've got someone with your club, if you're lucky enough to have there, someone there for 10 years, like, you have a vested interest and, again, maybe a moral obligation to look after that person's um, skull. So that's where it's been really, really helpful. Thanks, Tom. It's really, it's really interesting. We could talk about that that all day. I think. I think it's going to be a huge issue, and uh, and interesting to see you know technology and innovation coming in to help help guide that. Um, I'm conscious we've got quite a few questions in the Q and A. I see some more questions coming. If, if if you want to ask a question, please do just just pop it into the Q and A. I will try and get through these as as quickly um, as quickly as we can. We've still got a bit of time um, on on the session. So a question uh, here coming in uh, for you, Tom, from Jason. What did you? What do you need to do to transition from finance to sports science? Obviously, some people decide it's time to, to get into sports science. What would you? How did yeah. you do the transition? I hope and Jason's boss recommend? isn't on here as well, because that'll be super awkward <laughs> if he's asked that. Um, the so I was I was quite lucky. I think ten years ago, sports science was a degree you could do, but wasn't probably quite commonly taken. So it's Loughborough, Bath maybe a Birmingham and I was at Loughborough when I first I did, went to do economics and I wasn't really enjoying it and the head of the house there was like why don't you do sports science and I was like ah, I want to go and get a real job so I went off to UCL and did history and then when I left banking I basically set myself up as a personal trainer to pay to do a master's in strength and conditioning to then try and apply for uh, an internship at Harlequin so that I'm old enough that that was back in the days where they were unpaid internships which obviously does not happen anymore. Um, and so the route in now is quite different. So generally you need a master's to get a paid internship program. And then generally you're with a club or an institution for a year. And then that gives you that experience a lot. It's a long way around. It's like a lot of industries now, like you probably end up spending a good few years just gaining experience. So I worked with Alpine skiers. I worked with a basketball squad and kind of using personal training to then make ends meet around my mm -hmm. education and gaining work experience. Um, 
And the good news is it probably is more formalized. Like if you wound back 15 years ago, you kind of just had to wriggle your way in as a fitness guy into a club setup. Whereas now it's because it's much more professionalized as a profession, which is terrible English. Um, it's probably much more structured around having the degree as a bare minimum and then gaining as much experience to then transition over. Um, and then it's just, it's like all industries just getting a break really. Like we, we take on, uh, a paid intern every single year uh, and we also have placements that schemes set up with local universities so university of surrey they will do a year their year in industry is basically with us so we have a, a young lad called ethan at the moment who does a and another lad called alfie who's with the women's program um does an amazing job and it's just trying to give them that experience because the problem is is that you're not going to hire someone with one year's experience to work in a professional environment anymore so like you have to kind of gather as much experience as you can, as much exposure um, before leading into it. But yeah, if there's something you were considering, you probably have to go down the formalized education route first and find a way of financing yeah, yourself through that. Wherever it's really good uh, career advice there. So Jason can tell us, come back to us if he's, if he's made the switch or maybe advice for, for people's families as well. Um, it's interesting what you mentioned about that. I, I listened to one of the physios from Glasgow Warriors, one of the clubs I support. Also, obviously, watch Harlequins too, but I like Edinburgh Rugby, I like the Warriors. And, and yeah, the, the number of years of, of, of prior experience in, in other amateur areas and other aspects of sport before being at that, that elite level was, was quite amazing, actually. Um, there's a question here around using, do we, on more of the tactics side, do you, use, do you use data to analyze penalties, yellow cards, and, and track referees? Yeah, so we have our analysts do an amazing job of going through all the data we have. Um, and that's from watching video and then also like it's quite easy to compile these days what referees give penalties for and what they're more hot on and less hot on uh, and i mean i would i would show you other uh, but we basically around the whatsapp group there'll be a video that's put together every week that's sent through to the players essentially outlining what the referees tend to go look look at what they'll be going for what they've been hot on um so yeah like uh, the referee in rugby is because the way the laws are written, like they have, a, they have an influence on the game. We're lucky in the Premiership. I think we have a very good group of referees. I think it's something that I saw someone on Twitter talking about um, another tournament uh, and about how we're quite lucky. That this, the, the rugby referees themselves go through a huge feedback process in the week, and we kind of just piggyback on the the back of that and do our own, so that you know what you know. Some referees are real tight on what happens around the tackle area and whether or not it's conscious or subconscious if they favor the attacking or defending team. And we kind of know that. And we kind of try and feed that in. Um, and like people who follow us would have seen like last Friday against say, we, our discipline wasn't good enough. Uh, and that's nothing to do with the referee. That's us. Uh, but generally we try and, you know, the, the analysts do an amazing job. And when I was talking about all the data earlier, like I think the one thing that we've kind of seen stand out as a skill set isn't the accumulation of data. Like that's really easy now. Like seeing someone else's question here about the aggregating data, like we take it from a, like uh, I, I'm not counting the number of apps and stuff, but I guess it far exceeds twenty odd. But we just use stuff like Power BI, Tableau, the stuff that I'm sure everyone's um, used to hearing about, and we just use that to basically stick it all into one big reporting package so that people can log into one place and see everything. Um, but the analysts do an amazing job of, and that's the skill we probably prize. So Ian's question Sorry, was, you know, do you aggregate this all together? So who then looks at that kind of ag aggregated package of data? You said some some goes to the players for them to kind of analyze individual elements, yeah. would be the video analysis. Do, does the coaching staff, do they sit down and read those yeah. reports? I remember talking to some of the coaching staff and saying, yeah, you know what? I don't look at that too much. I just, I watch what's happening on the, on the pitch and I kind of make that my mind up. I don't really use all this data. Is that a challenge for you, all this different data that people actually be able to use it? Yeah, I think the way we go, we're lucky that we're a small organization comparative to the rest of the world, right? Like, even though we might have six or seven S&C people, like, it's not that big compared to teams in banking, right? Like, we're not massive. So it's probably highly individualized. Like, most of the stuff that goes to the players tends to be sort of like in, you know, if you can't do it in three bullet points, it's probably not something you're going to remember when someone's trying to smash your skull in on a Saturday afternoon. So, like, it has to be pretty succinct and to the point. Um, likewise, we use video a lot because it's more engaging. Our nutritionist does an amazing job of using Instagram. Like 
the boys or say the boys all of us are stuck on social media far more than we probably should be so if you put it on social media at least they're there for a good reason um and then feedback boards the old school like putting up a piece of paper and training reports feedback all of that we we try and tailor it and we you know i've worked with four four different head coaches uh tabai is very uh comfortable with data so he's not i wouldn't say he's data driven but he's very comfortable with it he's worked for a long time with data scientists around what's going on in the game as a wider trend and you will see the analysts in there for an hour on a monday morning talking through their stuff because sometimes the best way of getting through problems is talking about them right uh other times like my general thing is if you send someone a pdf not everyone's going to read it so you just need to figure out a better way of making it either engaging if that's the only way you can disseminate it um but generally, we try and give feedback one on one. If it's if it needs to be targeted at someone, you can't just expect them to read it off of a PDF. Like you, and again, we're very lucky in the way that we operate. It's easy to go up to someone and talk about it with the PDF in your yeah. hand. It's more tailored. It's interesting because I think that the, the, we have the same challenges. It's, it's universal, right? How do you communicate to that the actual person who needs to get that information, understand it visually, and, and different ways of, of of communicating that and you know, user experience and, and user interface design, which we do here, it comes to play a lot uh, to sort of simplify how we communicate things. There's a question coming from, from Mark here asking, that type of data, do you make that available to the national side as well? Do they do yeah. you feed data up into the national team? Yeah, so there is an agreement that exists that means that we have to. Um, and also it's in our players' interests, right? So uh, Marcus, Joe, Joe and Alex are all going away with England in the next few weeks. It's in our interest that they have an idea of physically where they're at, what they've been doing on the pitch. Um, so England can, I mean, international rugby is a step up. So you're kidding yourself if there's not going to be a step up, but you want to manage that process as best as they can and leave it in England's hands to to manage those guys. In. It's in their interest to obviously keep those guys in physical uh, shape. When it comes to other clubs, like, I mean, it's a nice environment. Like People want to understand the game more. We're at an early enough stage in sports science that we don't probably understand enough. And because you're often missing the other half of the, the conversation on a field, like often, you know, we can, for the same things that govern you guys, say for GDPR, et cetera, we don't share named data, but we can anonymize it and we can discuss that data Um to try and get a better feel so we can you know like there's not massive difference like it's generally the game isn't one because someone's running more or less on a field on a tuesday it's the it's the whole sum of its parts but we generally try to to be collaborative because i've just yeah. found that so, I was gonna uh, it's hard enough this just before the session tom around the where there's some gaps in the data analysis and the research particularly in the women's game which is really professionalized yeah. You know, massively in Harlequins being a pioneer in having you know a professional women's uh, team and, and a team doing very well. Um, and there's a gap though you were saying in the the amount of research that's available, um, and you know I'm assuming there's some collaboration perhaps between the clubs to to look at you know what research is needed uh, to help with whether that's strength and conditioning and fitness and performance. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so the the women's side of sport in general has probably been neglected for decades in terms of research. So we know comparatively little. Often what happens is you take a study that's happened in men and you just expect that same set of conditions. So whether it's a recommendation around uh, tendon loading or around like how to get someone stronger, that's just generally carried over. And by and large, you know, like men and women are the same species so like the same sort of stuff holds out but there are obviously some quite big differences like the obvious one being the menstrual cycle and the effect that hormones have on development whether it's testosterone for men or uh estrogen etc for women and like there is now a sort of booming research market in that and you can get apps that enable you to track those cycles and how it interacts with your physiology and it's different for every individual like it's not as uh, as simple as like uh you know, what holds true for one woman is the same for, for everyone. So likewise, the same with the guys as well. Like they're, they're all individuals, but there's just not the quality and amount of research in female sport yet. So that's something that we're, we're keen to address. We're keen to be part of. Um, we're privileged to be in the position that we've got a very competitive professional female squad. So you can probably answer a lot of questions about what happens at the elite end with those guys. Um, 
and we have a very good female support staff set up and the guys who run that so and ultimately like it's in your own interest if you want to figure out how to make them the strongest fastest fittest team in the premiership you're gonna have to understand their physiology and how that impacts their performance yeah that, that's that's really interesting and i think um you know it's great to see the development and and, and deepening of, of the professionalization it's, it's not just you know the um on-field aspect but all the off-field aspects um of, you know as well there's another question that's come in uh i get again for, from from ian asking about you know that monitoring that we we're talking around with the accelerometers and people being more aware of you know uh, concussions and, and and the injuries and the damage it can cause does that does that change people's psychology in in terms of how they um you know go about their business once they're on when they're on the pitch um, so it hasn't as far as we've seen uh changed this i mean i've never i'm not you can't always speak for someone else i've never seen it change anyone's attitude towards tackling if anything i feel like the squad feel like we're looking after them better so i think they feel like if i'm wearing this mouth guard and you know how much it's been infused um how much force is happening and we're very active in trying to like mike does an amazing job at being active engaging with them post so they're aware that we're looking at the data i think if you looked at it if you collect data and never use it people resent filling out that data like the the extrapolated out argument is when you talk to people who don't vote like they, when you ask them why you don't vote they say it doesn't make a difference anyway so if you start saying to someone about if you use the mouth guard and you're never feeding any data back to them very quickly they're like well, why am i even bothering to wear this but because we're quite active and engaging about it i think if anything they feel like they're better looked after by wearing it the the point about like the wealth of data we are very selective about not crowding out the important stuff so we probably feed back less than we ever have in terms of a training week so we only feed back uh in terms of like physical outputs about that nine 12 minute block on a tuesday because otherwise guys are looking at total running volumes and all this jazz that doesn't really matter like it doesn't matter how far our monday session is so low key it doesn't matter if it's 2k or 3k you've basically jogged around for it like adding information into the mix and like i was saying about the skill set of practitioners now is it's actually the ability to filter stuff and likewise mm. with the players, we're mindful that if you just give them too much, like you get overwhelmed, like you get it's paral paral paralysis by analysis, easy for me to say. Um, so like we try to, you know, like when it comes to sort of tactical stuff, like you've probably got three bullet points on attack, three bullet points on defense, and maybe a bullet point or two on the scrum and line out, and that's it. Like they have another, the line out calls is like a game of chess that's, kept in matt simmons or dino lamb's head so like asking them to do too much more is ridiculous so we we, we are very conscious of not overloading them with information because it doesn't matter like it matters to us it doesn't need to matter to them i I think it's a great point to to wrap up on perhaps tom because you know it's it's all this information all this but it's picking the right things to take action on the really important and key things that 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 the players are going to absorb that the coaches need to be aware of that you you're looking for and bringing that all together uh, i know we've got some more questions here but i'm really conscious we've had 50 minutes of your time you've answered so many questions um I've, we've really asked you everything i have even more questions we, we could ask you i think we'll have to have you come back yeah i'm happy to go for another five or ten minutes if it if it I, I thought i'd be here till two so i'm more than happy to keep answering if it works for you guys Okay, well, here, well, look, here, here's here's an interesting one. Um, yes. Yeah. So some of the uh, 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 has it? I mean, I was going to ask you this as well. So obviously, there's some new laws come in, right? The fifty twenty two and, and yep. other kinds of um, slight tweaks to laws. Has has um, I don't know if World Rugby used any any data to set their laws. Have you adjusted? Uh, have you looked at yeah. data to to analyze those tactics? So like World Rugby use a different mouth guard provider, but still a like a valid way of assessing the tackle. So they've looked at this is where a lot of the, the sort of stuff around how the collision happens, like all of their decisions about like lowering tackle heights, et cetera, are entirely guided by data. So they've looked at the forces, the occurrence of concussions, the occurrence of head injuries, when they happen, how they happen. Um you always get unintended consequences, like um with any law changes like originally years ago when the game became a game of uh like t- kick tennis it was it was designed to make it more of a contest of the breakdown but obviously what happened was people didn't want to have possession of the ball which is thankfully reversed now um 
but with the collision stuff, like it's entirely led by like so world rugby's all of their decision making will be off of data and what they've seen. They often also uh, so like the the fifty twenty two rule was trialed in the New Zealand Cup level, so they'll often trial it at like a level just below the elite tier before it comes in. So you know, and then that will have gone through a whole process of like looking at what changed. Like, <clears throat> do you, do you get if you do get more space on the field, does it lead to more tries? Because rugby is in a um, uh, an ecosystem of other sports and it's competing for people's time on a Saturday afternoon or a Friday night. So something that I agree with is it, it does need to be entertainment orientated. Like you, as much as I like rugby for its different sizes and its different characters, I think you can still tailor it to being more watchable because that leads to a bigger market that leads to a better sport because you've got more finances to fund looking after the players the player experience you get when you come to the stoop all that jazz so like yeah world rugby uses it and i think they use it relatively well to change the laws but sometimes you get unintended consequences you didn't you know you you didn't plan for we're always looking at ways of maximizing the laws so it's not world rugby's fault when we figure out a way of um sidestepping them so another question that, that that we had was um so we talked a lot about preparing players for performance and and of you know distance run and and so on and we just talked about more tactics there a little bit. Um, how how much analysis is done of you know comp- of, you know other teams what other teams are doing, looking at their tactics, look at the patterns that they play, and then adjusting yeah. or adapting or preparing for that. Is that is that a significant aspect of of the data analysis? Yeah, so that's, that is pretty much what our analysts do Monday to Sunday. They'll be looking at the next opposition. They often look a couple of weeks in advance, looking at their patterns of play, who they go to, what they're trying to do. Again, all the data that we have about our players is, um, so Opta, who are sort of synonymous with sports data, like they provide all the data for all the games around the world. So we can look at the same data set about, um, you know, the X and Y coordinates and who's being beaten by what type of tackle for a game yeah. in the Southern Hemisphere, in a game in the Premiership, a game in France. It's all the same, which makes uh, analysing it a lot easier. Um, and it gives our analysts a huge data set to work from. So every aspect is is kind of covered. And in the Premiership, you have the benefit of you've pretty much played them twice a year. Every Like Saracens, last year aside, we've played twice a year for over a decade now so you have an idea of where they're going what they're about and then you also use their games against other teams to what they've changed this year um but yeah it's all it's and all used it's all kind of putting us down at the, the the training ground some of the teams saying yeah well we we get the data from opta but you know we also we have somebody ourselves manually collecting data or checking data ourselves as well is that is that we talked about some of the sensors and things are people one of the questions from from yash is are you collecting some of that data manually or are there you know, obviously opt to, I guess you buy that data in, but yeah. you put the data manually as well or with tools or how? So like the GPS and all that, those, most of the like physical stuff, whether it's forces on a force plate, it's all app based. So it kind of just feeds into some cloud-based portal that we will use an API to pull it down from. Uh, the manual side of that stuff is fine enough. Like, so yesterday or most Tuesdays, I will be tally counting scrums live so because you could video it and you could count it back up afterwards but i'm out on the training field anyway so i generally stood there and yesterday i'd lost my piece of paper that i usually count on. so i had a starbucks cup so i had the number of scrums they did just tied on my scar and then just take a picture of it on my phone and then type in later so there is a manual element there is there is a uh <laughs> a very uh schoolboy element sometimes to it but generally it's not on the side of a coffee cup um if there's probably now Saracens fans rifling through our bins to see what else we write on coffee cups, but no, there's it's um, generally like like everything in the life, like there's there's apps for everything that record everything, and once we we go through a process of being happy that the app's behaving itself, like it's giving you good data, like like all this stuff. I mean, some of it comes in through in zeros and ones, so we're spending time on. You know, the pandemic was great for me because I got to upskill on Python and R and all that kind of jazz and. Which is lucky because it helps talking some of these languages, but other other apps they summarise it all for you beautifully, and we don't right. interfere with that. But yeah, there is still the tally count that occurs every Tuesday on my coffee still cup. Some, yeah, some manual stuff. I guess it helps you feel that you're you you trust it. But it's amazing to see, you know, if you're using those 
those languages and, and the development of these apps um, is, is really, really fantastic. So we managed to squeeze in a couple of extra, an extra questions there. I think we pretty much covered everything. I think if we didn't answer them 100% directly, I think we kind of covered them in, in other, other questions. So again, Tom, I just really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Congratulations again on, on last season and, and best of luck for, Thank you. for this season and for you personally for your various new arrivals um, that, are, that are on the way. And um, yeah, thank also, you. I mean, you know, if anyone wants to, of course, you can go down uh, to the Stupin and watch Harlequin's, uh, Harlequin's play. So um, there's some materials if you want to know more about um, our, our partnership with, uh, with Harlequin's and the kind of things that we do with data. But really, huge thanks to Tom and, and thanks to everyone for all of your questions. This has been a really, really fascinating session. And um, uh, I think people are seeing the same in, in the QA. So, Thanks very much, and yeah, we we'll hope you get back out onto the uh, onto the pitch with your with with your Starbucks cup or not uh, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.